But for those of you who don't know, this is uh, sponsored by Social Venture Partners San Antonio. And Social Venture Partners is an affiliate of a nationwide organization. We're one of 44. And our model is we are a giving organization. So we pool our donations together to give grants to organizations. But really the primary work that we do is to walk alongside nonprofits and provide skills and provide our knowledge and our experience to help them be better. Sort of like a venture capitalist might work with somebody that they invest in. It's kind of our model with building our community. Um, it was started in Seattle and we are about four years old here in San Antonio, thanks to some of the people who are on this call, Billy and Jennifer, are some of our founding members, as is Beth. Um, one of our big corporate sponsors, of course, is Documation, and that's the Scantlands. They have been wonderful. Uh, some of the work that we do, uh, so I see one of our nonprofit leaders, Amir, is here. He leads a youth organization that's wonderful. But um, that's a little bit about us. We have seen great results from being able to put together our gifts of talent and funding to help grow some neat organizations in San Antonio. Um, uh, real quick, I'm gonna get Janie to say a little bit about why she's involved in the community in a lot of different ways, and she's one of our newest partners, that's what we call our donors. Just give us a little idea of Janie, how you got involved and why Social Venture Partners is one of those special things that, that you give your time to. Absolutely. Thank you, Becky. Thank you everyone for joining tonight. Uh, I'm really, really excited to hear what you have to say and I'll, um, but I'll get right into it. Um, I was approached by Becky and Harriet and what you, if it, any of you know Harriet and Hilly, you don't say no to her, but um, I really, really enjoyed the idea of being able to give your time and your talent back to the community. I'm young and I don't have the, the major funds at the time, but I also do have some, the energy and the talent to do things. So that's why I really felt like I was um, inclined to join this group, but it was such a close knit, like family feel that we were all just collectively getting together to really, really support the larger community. And I think we just got the stars the limit right now. We've got a great group of people to work with. So, and stealing from others' talents too is always a good thing too. <laughs> we are actually here to talk to Pat Witte and to Chip Conley about something, a great subject. Stories. I want to know, you know, what happened to kind of move you in this direction. I'll turn it over to Pat, who will bring in Chip to do the to do the rest of the program. And so here you go, Pat. I'm kind of lobbing it over to you. Okay, thank you, Becky. Hey, it's really great to have this opportunity to talk with you. You know, I, I tell you, I'm probably the oldest groupie that you'll ever meet. Uh, I've been following Chip Conley for years, literally five or six years I've been following him. He might even say I've been stalking him because uh, he's been a very important person in my life. And uh, I want to tell you about how I have really benefited and grown and become a modern elder in these later years of my life and how he's helped me do that. And so I'm, I wanna share a little bit about my story and talk about my evolution as a modern elder. And I, I really love Becky's title when she used the word evolution of a modern elder. And I kinda like to play with words. So I, I looked up those three words in the dictionary just to get an accurate uh, meaning of them. And evolution, of course, means uh, according to the dictionary, the gradual <laughs> development of something, especially from a simple to a more complex form. Uh, that's pretty good. I'd say I've kind of evolved into a more complex person over the years. Modern, uh, of course, means relating to the present or recent times as opposed to the remote past. And uh, I, I'll talk a little bit more about my journey there, but for a long time in my life, I was hanging on pretty tightly to the past and my past life. And one of the things I learned from Chip Conley and the Modern Elder Academy is how to let go of some of those things and how to let go of some of the mindsets that were holding me back. And then elder is an often misunderstood word. <laughs> totally misdirects people. <clears throat> An elder is simply the oldest person in the room. So if you're 40 years old and you're in a room full of 30 year olds, you're the elder. Okay, so I, I, I'm guessing that uh, I might be one of the elders in this room. But, you know, the, the evolution of the modern elder 
and I think the modern elders probably needed more now than it ever has been. And so let me just tell you a little bit about my experience and how I came across this, because I was struggling with getting older, like a lot of people. I, I was terrified of it. I, I, I did not want to get old, and I was trying to stop the unstoppable. Uh, my mind wasn't aging, but other things were. And then I was not only feeling the internal effects of aging, I was feeling the external effects, what the culture was doing to me. And I was buying into the cultural narrative about getting older. And frankly, folks, our culture is not all that nice to older people sometimes. And I just thought that's the way it was supposed to be. And of course, this starts at the 40th birthday. I know you've all experienced this. This is when it all begins. You get the black balloons. You get those insulting birthday cards, over the hill cards. And the whole underlying message is, all right, you've reached the pinnacle of your life now. And the rest of it is just gliding downhill. And then it gets worse as you go on. And so ageism is real. Now, I... I, I, I talk about ageism kind of reluctantly here because this is certainly is not the most important ism right now. The, the biggest ism in our culture and our society is, is racism and it's rampant. But ageism is really has been cooking <laughs> underneath the surface for a long time. And you know, you don't really recognize it and feel it, at least I didn't, until I got older. And then I started recognizing the subtle effects of it. Uh, one of the first uh, indicators for me was uh, in a social situation, networking, meeting people, hi, how are you? And normally the next question I ask is, so uh, what do you do? This time, <laughs> this man asked me, said, are you, so you're retired? <clears throat> that, you know, that, that really hurt me. And then later on, I got the senior discount at the movie without asking for it. <laughs> and that's not either. And then shortly after that, I read in Chip's book, a phrase that he used it's called facial discrimination. <laughs> and I love that. I thought, man, I know exactly what you're talking about. Because now then, I was getting a real firsthand understanding of what discrimination feels like, of what it feels like to be stereotyped or pigeonholed based solely on your experience, I mean, your, your appearance, by, by people who know nothing of your, your experience. And so I, I'm really feeling that. And so that's when I, I ran across the, the Chip's book uh, that, that was just mentioned. And I read that book and I thought, wow, you know, he's talking to me. He's talking about me. I don't know how he knows this much about me, but I see myself in that book. And I don't know if you've ever read The Hero's Journey by Joseph Campbell, but I felt the call. And as you know, The Hero's Journey is the hero hears the call, that's the first step. And I heard the call clearly to go to the Modern Elder Academy. I didn't know how I was gonna do it. I couldn't afford it, didn't have the time, but I felt the call. And as you probably know, the next step is the, the hero resists the call. And so I resisted the call, I can't afford it, don't have the time, but I did it. <clears throat> Somehow it worked out and I went there Talking about crossing the threshold, I got on a plane and flew to Baja, another country, to go into this strange place, people I don't even know. And so I'm sitting there the first day at the Modern Elder Academy in a circle of about 16 people. And I just happened to be sitting right next to Chip. <clears throat> so he turns to me and he said, so what percentage of your adult life do you think is still ahead of you? I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm 78. <laughs> There's not a lot. <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of at the end of it. And then he, he shared with me and the rest of the group this elegant formula that helped me realize that I still had 25% of my adult life left ahead of me. And it's simply this. He said, take your current age and subtract 18 because 18 is when we become an adult. So in my case, I was 78, subtract 18, that's 60. So you put that number 60 at the top of the fraction. Now then you take your life expectancy and subtract 18 from that. Well, now your life expectancy, we have to guess at. 
but I took an educated guess at mine based on my genetics, my family history, the fact that I take real good care of myself. And I figured, well, you know, I'm going to live at least to be 98. That, that's a good guess. So I take 98 minus 18. And now then that leaves 80, right? So now I've got 60 over 80. And I reduce that down to three quarters. And that, of course, translates to 75%. Well, that's kind of the bad news because now then, okay, that means that I've already used up 75% of my adult life. But the good news is I got 25% left. <laughs> And I never really thought about it that way before. So if all of a sudden I'm thinking, even at age 78, I probably have at least 25% of my adult life left in front of me, what am I gonna do with it? What, what am I gonna do with it? And I think somebody mentioned earlier, as we get older, you know, in our younger years, our resume virtues are the most important thing to us. We, we work real hard to build a good resume and build strong skills and build a reputation. But as we get older, uh, our legacy virtues become more important to us. We really want to give back and, and do something meaningful. We want to be useful. And there's nothing worse than not being useful. And unfortunately, our culture sometimes pushes us aside. And so some of the things I learned at the Modern Elder Academy was to change my mindsets about myself, about my future, and what I was capable of doing. I had to let go of some of those mindsets and move on. They were holding me back. I learned about intergenerational coaching, which is such a beautiful concept. The idea of, of taking the elders in our companies and marrying them with the millennials and bringing them together in coaching partnerships so the millennials learn from the elders and the elders learn from the millennials what a fabulous idea and so you know i came back and i wanted to do what i could do to to further that idea and and plant that thought in the minds of people especially who are running companies uh, one of the things i did at the time i i at 78 i had a really good job as the dean of the school of business at a small university here in san antonio but I found myself every morning driving up to work in my private parking spot. That was really good. I had my own private parking place. And, but I would be sitting there in my car. And I'm thinking, I don't want to go up there. But that darn paycheck had me chained to that job. I could not summon up the courage to, to leave that paycheck. Because you see, I didn't play that three chapter game very well about get a good education and get a good job and retire and live happily ever after because I, I didn't have the money, the resources to leave a job. And part of me says, you should stay here. But I said, what do I want my legacy to be? Is this what I want to leave behind? Boy, he showed up for work every day and he sat in that cubicle and he behaved himself and he answered every email right on time. You know, I thought I'm capable of doing more than that. And I never would have gotten to that point if it hadn't been for Chip Conley and the Modern Elder Academy. So, you know, I, I, and I've done a lot of reading and research in this subject in the last year or so. And uh, there's a, a researcher, Dr. Phil Pizzo of the Stanford Career Institute, who's done some research on this. And he said that really all we need as we get older is only three things. It's interesting that one of those is not money. <laughs> we only need three things. So we need purpose. We need purpose. We need a reason to get out of bed in the morning and do something worthwhile. We need wellness. If we don't take care of ourselves, we're not healthy. We cannot enjoy these later years of our life. And we need a community. We need to be with friends and family and people we can connect with and feel that we belong. And so I would just close this part of my presentation with, with this idea. If, if, you're, if you're running a company or if you're in an organization, tap into the wisdom of your elders because we need our elders now probably more than ever because so many people are suffering, they're stressed, they're worried, they're scared, they're lonely. Elders have been down this road before. We're worried too. But see, this is what I learned at the Modern Elder Academy. There's four things that we need to do in order to be a modern elder. 
We need to evolve, keep current with the times. We need to learn and be committed to lifelong learning, or as Chip calls it, long life learning. <laughs> we need to hang on to that curiosity that we had as a little kid. You know, we drove our parents crazy with that word. Why, why, why? You know, I said, shut up. I don't know why. You've just taken me down to the bottom of the well here and I can't answer it anymore. But they just got this wonderful curiosity. So we got to evolve. We got to be curious and learn. We got to collaborate and be willing to jump in and share ideas and listen to others. And then finally, we've got to counsel and coach and mentor people. And now more than ever, we need our elders to coach and counsel and mentor and support and help the other people through this difficult time in our society. So I hope that's been helpful to you. And now most of what I said, I've learned from this next gentleman, Chip Conley, that I want to introduce to you, who uh, has done such wonderful things. He's doing such wonderful things for society by making the modern elder the worst midlife wisdom school uh, available to people who want to figure out what they want to be when they grow up and how to enter into these later years. And, uh, and by the way, I was probably the oldest guy at the Modern Elder Academy. The average age is around 50. So, you know. So anyway, I want to I uh, introduce you to Chip Conley and uh, turn it over to him now to share his story. Thank you very much. Oh, Pat, you're amazing. Gosh, I, I feel such a sense of gratitude for having you and Debbie in my life. You, you just, you know, all I can say is thank you. I um, am looking forward to spending more time with you in Texas. Uh, <clears throat> let me give a, a little background on myself uh, to those of you who don't know me. Um, so I have been a Northern California guy for a very long time. I uh, went to Stanford undergrad, went to Stanford Business School, and, um, and then started a boutique hotel company called Joie de Vivre, which became the second largest in the US. Uh, but only was in California. Um, I sold the company at the bottom of the Great Recession, and I didn't know what was next. Um, many of you probably saw the film with called The Intern with Robert De Niro and Anne Hathaway. Well, Robert De Niro <clears throat> says in the movie, musicians don't retire, they quit when there's no more music left inside of them. I was 50 years old. I had music still inside me, but I didn't really know with whom to share it. And that's about the time I got a call from a guy named Brian Chesky, uh, who was the co-founder and CEO of Airbnb. Now this was really early 2013, so more than seven and a half years ago. I didn't even know much about Airbnb. Here I was a longtime hotelier who created 52 boutique hotels with my company, and I didn't really even know much about what Airbnb was. Brian wanted to meet with me and he wanted me to help to help take this little tech startup and turn it into a hospitality brand. And as, as he said to me, I want you to help us to democratize hospitality. He says, can I Uber over to your house um, to tell you more about this? And this is early 2013 and we, we forget about how, how quickly technology becomes a, a, a fundamental part of our lives. I had never heard of Uber in early 2013, and I'm based in San Francisco where Uber is based. So I said, you're going to do what? He says, that I'm going to take a cab, sort of a modern version of a cab, over to your house, and then I want to talk to you. And we spent a whole afternoon talking. He convinced me to be the head of global hospitality and strategy for the company at a time when I wasn't really looking for a job, nor definitely not a 70-hour-a-week job. Um, but what was really interesting is he said, you're going to be my mentor, but I'm going to be your boss. <laughs> he didn't say it that way and that succinctly, but that was really what he was hinting at, is that um, I was going to have a boss that was 21 years younger than me while also being his mentor. <laughs> you can imagine the first time he gave me a, um, uh, a review, a, a, a employee review, um, he gave me a 30 minute review, went on and on and on. And it, it, he said good things, you know, gave me some good constructive feedback as well. And at the end of his 30 minutes, he said, so what do you think? And I didn't know how to respond to him, whether I was supposed to respond to him as, as his mentor to say, well, that's a good or a bad job of giving a, an employee review or whether I was supposed to respond as his, as his direct report saying, yes, boss, um, I agree or I just don't agree with you on what you've said about me. 
all I know is that over the course of my four full-time uh, years with Brian, um, I found that he and I created a relationship of reciprocity, what I now call mutual mentorship. And I became a mentor, uh, not a mentor, not an intern, but both, a mentor and an intern. Um, I was an intern when it came to learning technology, uh, both my own technology tools, but also what's it like to work in a technology company because I joined the company at age 52. I was twice the age of the average employee in the company. So I was really very, not in my normal habitat, especially having been CEO of my own company for 24 years. So all of a sudden I'm, you know, the person who's there at times feeling like I'm the dumbest person in the room. So I had to learn how to let go of my, as, as Pat said in, in the four steps, evolve, learn, collaborate, counsel. Um, I had to learn how to actually let go of my ego, let go of my identity of being the CEO of the company. I needed to let go of some of my historical knowledge about the hospitality business because Airbnb was taking a very different approach to hospitality. <clears throat> um, so, but in letting go of some of that, what we now at, at the Modern Elder Academy or MEA call the great midlife edit. <laughs> when you do the great midlife edit, and to be, to be frank, the midlife is a state of mind. I think it's age 35 to 75, but that means that, that Pat wouldn't even be in it. And Pat is absolutely still in midlife for sure. So, you know, midlife is a state of mind. And, and the thing that's interesting about midlife is it's a state of mind that has a really bad brand. <laughs> I mean, like, if I were to say midlife and then add a word at the end, you would say crisis. Midlife crisis. We don't understand midlife very well. And it's partly because it's a very new phase of life or stage of life in the history of humankind. Uh, midlife didn't really exist in the 19th century. Um, the longevity in the year 1900 was 47 years old in the U.S. By the year 70, by the year 2000, it was 77. We added three decades of longevity in one century. That's unusual. And what it led to was three life um, stages that were sort of new. Um, I'll tell you, I'll take you quickly through the first two, and then talk a little bit about a little bit about midlife, then talk about MEA, and then we'll open it up for Q and A. So the three life stages, um, actually, just for fun, in chat, write down what you think those three life stages were. Um, what do you think, in, just put it in the chat because that gets interactive. What do you think are the three life stages that got discovered in the 20th century? I'm sorry, in the night, yeah, 20th century, in, in, in the last century. Let's see if anybody has any, any, anything. I'm gonna see if anybody puts anything in there. Um, and Pat, you can't do it because you know, I think you probably know the answer. Um, so let me, adolescence, yes. Well, actually, Jamie's pretty good here. Um, adolescence, absolutely. Midlife is the second one, and the third one is retirement. So let's talk about those briefly. So adolescence, we've had it forever, but until the year 1904, we didn't have a word for it. We didn't also call people teenagers. We just sort of said, you hit puberty and you're an adult. Go work in the mines, get married, have two babies by the time you're 18. And then um, a guy named Stanley Hall <clears throat> basically wrote a book called Adolescence and said that this era of life, adolescence, your teen years, is a time full of emotional, physical, and hormonal changes. And it's preparing you for this next era of life, the threshold to adulthood. So there's three, three threshold, three, you know, stages in life, childhood, adulthood, and then elderhood. Um, so adolescence after 1904 became a whole different thing. The, the uh, public junior high school uh, and high school system in the US came, as, came about because of adolescence being discovered. So it's gotten, adolescence has gotten a huge investment in it by the government, by public policy. The next one to talk about is retirement. Retirement got a ton of attention in the Great Depression, partly because in many ways, the government wanted to get old people out of the workplace to get young people in because the unemployment rate was 25%, but also it was because pensions were necessary, because social security was necessary. There needed to be a safety net. 
Uh, and so, uh, especially as families were not living together as much, you know, young people were going to the cities to work in the industri in, in industry and the, fa and the parents were staying on the farm. Okay, so retirement and pensions and social security got an enormous investment. Um, and then there's midlife. So adolescence, adolescence 1904, that's when it got discovered with that book. Uh, retirement, you know, depending upon pensions started, you know, in the early part of the century, but 1930s is when social security, retirement, as we know it, became, sort of came into its existence. In 1965, uh, a Canadian psychologist coined the term midlife crisis. And of the three of these life stages, and, and midlife became a life stage in the 20th century, partly because we lived longer. When you only lived till age 47, 25 or 30 was not midlife. <laughs> but when you lived to 77, or now 85, or, or in Pat's case, 98, midlife is like a marathon. But if you are running the midlife marathon and you're carrying all of your historical baggage and the mindsets you've always used, um, then you are gonna be worn out pretty quickly. So it was after my four years at Airbnb working there and realizing, wow, we have a lot of ageism in technology and in Silicon Valley. And a lot of people I know my age, I'm, I'm now just about to turn 60, two months from now. A lot of people my age were feeling irrelevant in their 50s. And a lot of people, uh, the, the suicide rate for people 45 to 64 has grown by 50% in the last 20 years. So I am down in Baja, an hour north of Cabo San Lucas, the southern Baja Peninsula. I'm not very far from the U.S., quite frankly. It's a less than two-hour flight from San Diego. It's a three-hour flight from San Francisco. Um, and from San Antonio, from Houston, it's, a, I think, a two-hour, two-and-a-half-hour flight, maybe. Um, so I, I have a house on the beach, my first, second home. The first, you know, I, I, and so I'm, here, I'm writing this book on the beach. I'm going for a run on the beach. And on a, the run back to my home on this beach, this deserted beach that I live on, three miles long, I had this epiphany, or what we in, at MEA called a Baja Aha. And my Baja Aha was this. There's a word that has actually been discovered in the last 15 or 20 years in the social sciences, but it's not gone mainstream. And it's not adolescence, because that was you know, 116 years ago. It's middle essence. Middle essence is the bookend to adolescence. Adolescence has you coming into adulthood, and middle essence is toward the end of your adult period, moving toward elderhood. Elderhood, not, not elderly. If you're elderly, it's usually the last five or 10 years of your life. If you're an elder, as Pat said, it, it's a relative term. You could be an elder at age 40. So why is it that we have absolutely no schools, tools, rites of passage, rituals, or anything to help us during our middle essence period, which is often the core of that is about age 45 to 60. We just don't help people with their roadmap of life. And so we call it a midlife crisis, partly because people don't know what to do with this era of their life. But if you've ever read any of Carl Jung's work, a famous psych uh, psychologist, he said, you can't live the afternoon of your life based upon the rules of the morning. And he said that the, um, primary operating system for your life for the first half of your life is your ego and, the, and it's your soul for the second half of your life. But we have nothing in the way of, of programs for, to help people to introduce them to this, to help them understand what is the life stage that is <clears throat> midlife and how do you create legacy? How do you create that purpose, wellness, and community? Um, and how do you make sure that you're not feeling like you're all alone in this? And this is particularly true for men. Um, while 62% of the people who come to MEA or women with an average age of uh, overall in the whole program is 54 years old, we're from 24 countries, by the way, had 750 alums. Um, it is men who actually frankly need it the most because we're not very good as men in reaching out and being vulnerable with others. So long story short, we started the program uh, uh, in early 2018 and we've had 750 alums. And it's, we're closed now for COVID. Um, we will be reopening in October but with something called sabbatical, uh, sabbatical sessions, which is more oriented toward longer term stays, but with a certain amount of MEA programming. Um, you could, you know, the sabbatical sessions piece of this is not public yet. It's not on the website yet. 
it'll be on there in about two weeks. Um, but you're welcome to go to the website, modernelderacademy.com, and to learn more. Um, let me just say this, uh, and, and it's a social enterprise, so I don't make any money on it. I built the campus for free. I don't charge rent uh, to, to the program. I don't pay myself anything, partly because I had a few friends commit suicide during the Great Recession. And I knew all of the men, I knew that they could use something like this, something that helps them to understand that we all need a midlife pit stop. Um, you know, the history of of modern adulthood has suggested that there are three stages in life. You learn during your, your younger year, years, you earn during your most of your adult years, and then you retire at age 65. And you do it in lockstep linear order. Uh, if you explain that to a millennial today, they look at you and laugh and say, what? No way. <laughs> that's not how I'm going to live my life. Um, but that's how we've learned our lives. And then we get to our midlife and we're like a vehicle running on fumes. As if somehow all of the learning we ever did, we, we learned before we were age 25. And that's just not true. And certainly not true in a world where we're going to live longer, power seems to be moving younger, and the world is changing faster. So to summarize, I'd just say, um, I'm gonna be a neighbor of yours. I live in Austin part of the year. I live in Baja most of the year. Uh, I still have a, a small condo in San Francisco when I'm here. Um, but I, more than anything, I, I think what we need to help people understand, and I, I try to do that in my book, Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder, is how to realize that over the course of your life, you can cultivate and harvest your wisdom and offer it to the world in a way that makes you feel not useless, um, but useful and relevant, and actually, frankly, energized. Um, I'll never forget one of the most famous executive recruiters in the world said to me when she heard that I was doing this, and she said, just remind everybody you talk to, especially if they're out of work looking for a job, that yes, there is a certain amount of ageism in the recruiting world, and especially when it comes to looking at resumes and LinkedIn, et cetera. But if you can get your foot in the door using networking and other means, show up with curiosity and a passionate engagement and the wrinkles will fade away. Because what people read and people want in their life is people with energy. And when I say energy, I don't mean it woo-woo energy. I mean someone who's just energized by life, someone who's curious by life. This is why a modern elder is not like the traditional elder just being the wise one, but often they're the most curious person in the room. And curiosity and wisdom, the perfect alchemy of curiosity and wisdom, in my opinion, defines what a modern elder is. So I'm just gonna open it up to the group now to see um, what kind of questions you have and Pat and I will try to answer them and um, feel free to you know, direct certain questions to Pat if, if that's appropriate. And, um, and I just am honored to be here. I, I really am, as, especially since uh, I went to the final four uh, in San Antonio long ago. Um, and so I have great memories of NC2A uh, final four there, one of the many times it's been in San Antonio, I'm sure. So let's see what, what we have here. I think there's gonna be some questions. I, I have been curious just because I have a lot of friends. I'm one of those who left, um, you know, I've put in my 30, 33 years of working 60 hour jobs. Um, I, I didn't have children, so I've worked the entire time. And a lot of my friends though are in the same situation and we have left um, long-term jobs or left the last and we've started our own thing, either that's part of the gig economy. And um, I, I wondered if there's a difference in what you're seeing in men who come to the stage and women who come to the stage. Is yeah. there a difference? Sure, let's, let, let, I'll, I'll try to take that one on. Um, there's a big difference. And uh, there's a, in, in my book, I talk about Folkman and Zenger. Zenger and Folkman, they, they write for the Harvard Business Review a lot. They have a, they have a study they did that showed that um, a willingness to learn and an openness to getting feedback is correlated with a, both curiosity and a willingness and, a, and a, an ability to get better over time. 
women are better at, uh, at this than men. Women know, women actually gain confidence with time. Men start to plateau in terms of their confidence in their mid 40s and sometimes early 50s. And so women are on this growth path, uh, partly because they are, are constantly learning and they're trying to improve themselves, whereas men are trying to prove themselves and, and maybe over time just trying to win. And a, a woman named Carol Dweck from Stanford, psychologist, talked about this in a book called Mindset. So long story short is I would say women are in their fifth, oh, one other fact, the U curve of happiness. So the, the point in life across all cultures that people are, tend to be least happy um, is between age 45 and 50. Uh, and it's between age 22 to 25, all the way to 45 to 50. It's just a, a slow decline. And then 50s and on, it gets better. People are happier in their 50s than their 40s, 60s and 50s, 70s and 60s, and women in their 80s happier than their 70s. Women tend to get more confident and happier after age 50 at, a, at an incline that's better than for men. Um, and of course, women live longer, longer than men. So I, what I would say is all that bodes well for women. Um, in terms of the idea of the gig economy and port, creating a portfolio career, which is another way sometimes people put it, which means you have a series of things you do to make money and to, and to just uh, engage yourself in the working world, that is absolutely the future. Um, and more and more people, especially as they get to an age, maybe in their 60s, uh, 50s or 60s, and certainly later, might say, I don't want to work full time, I want, but I don't want to retire. I want something in between. And if the, the companies that get smart at this and start actually taking some of their institutionalized wisdom, people in their 50s who want to actually move into this or 60s and want to move into this and say, yeah, you're fi five days a week. Let's move you to three days a week. And they say, sure, I'll stick around. But instead, we have this, this um, cliff. You know, you sort of, you know, on Friday, you're working five days a week. On Monday, you don't have a job because you've retired. It is not only bad for our health, and retirement has been proven to actually accelerate your morbidity or your mortality, um, but it's also not good for companies because they, on, on Friday, they have all of that wisdom walking out the door. So, um, who else? We have, Beth asked, what do, you, what do you like most about your MOA? What are just, real quick. Uh, about MEA, that's, that's a Pat question. MEA, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And Pat, then Jamie also asks, or Pat, yeah, you want to say what's, what's, what, what's your favorite thing about the yeah. Modern Elder Academy? Well, I, I always have trouble with favorites, but here's one of the things that I like so much about it. I was really a little bit intimidated the first time I went there. I didn't know what to expect. I anticipated a lot of really high-powered executive type people, authors and writers and things like that. And I, you know, that, that part of me was saying, you know, I don't really belong here. Uh, that didn't turn out to be true because what I discovered was that at MEA, we meet people from the inside out. Nobody has an, a badge with their title on it. There's no roster published in advance. You just go there and from day one, they're just other human beings. And I remember this last time on the first day, I was sitting out on the veranda by the beach and I got involved in this wonderful conversation, about an hour long conversation with a, a woman named Dumitha. And, you know, we were just interacting with each other, just like we'd known each other all of our life. And then at the end of the conversation, I realized that she was a war correspondent with the BBC. I mean, boom. I mean, if, if you probably, if you'd have told me that in the beginning, I wouldn't even have gone up to her and talked to her, but you know, so I like that you, from day one, you were kind of embraced in this uh, love and acceptance. It doesn't matter who you are, how old you are, where you came from, everybody is on an equal basis. That was one of my most favorite things about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next well, question. Um, Jamie is asking, how do you peel back some of the unwillingness to, to change or enter this? She says, my father's retired and I feel like fears doing more. You fears doing more? Fears, oh, fears, fears doing more. Fears, so, Say the first part of the question. Sorry, sorry. I think I phrased it a little wrong. But I, so I just want to be able to approach my dad in a way that I can 
get rid of some of the fears that he may have in, in, mm-hmm. in going out and doing more instead of um, uh, just staying at home. And that's what I'm yeah. fearing. Like you said, it's, it's kind of yeah. that, that helps in mortality. And I want him to, he has so much more skills and capabilities. Yeah. And I feel like he's like, I just don't want to do it. So. Yeah. So it's, a, it, it, it's, it's a great question. It's a hard question in COVID times because people are staying right. at home and, and, and it's, their lives are getting smaller by, by, by the day. And um, so let me, let, me, let me drill down a little bit on this mindset thing, because it actually really is fundamental to what we teach and what helps people, I think. Um, so Carol Dweck says, basically, you can have a fixed or a growth mindset. When you have a fixed mindset, you have a tendency to focus on the things that you can win because you define success as winning and you're, you like to prove yourself. So that's fine, but what that means as you get older is there's fewer things that you actually feel like you do really well maybe, and therefore your sandbox gets smaller and smaller, and you don't say, okay, well, I'm 72 years old or 78 years old, and I'm going to learn Spanish because you sort of feel like I don't want to look stupid. I don't want to, you know, like learning a language in my 70s, that's crazy. Like, why would anybody do that? Um, But the other alternative to that, the fixed mindset is the growth mindset. And when you have a growth mindset, you're not focusing on proving yourself. You're focusing on improving yourself. And winning isn't defined, I mean, success isn't defined by winning. It's defined by learning. And so helping a person move into the direction of being open to learning and being a beginner's mind, trying something. So the things, the kind of questions, if I, if you and, if it was you, me and your dad and we're having dinner, and you, told, and you gave me a little advance warning, but I didn't want to look like I was trying to be psychoanalyzing him. I might ask him some questions like, you know, like what, it, what, what makes you curious? Like, is there anything in life that makes you curious these days? Or like, what's a subject that you were really fascinated by when you were younger or even in your early adulthood that you never really got to take on completely because you just got on in a working world and you had to put the blinders on and you had a family and that. You know, one of the things about midlife is often you're juggling a lot. You don't have time to be curious. You don't have time to try new things. You don't have time to learn something. Um, and so I would, I would go down the path of trying to understand what things in life make, give some sense of curiosity or have a historical frame for him that was saying, you know what, I used to really be interested in that. What's a dream? Or actually sometimes for a man, <laughs> What's your bucket list? Men tend to like bucket lists. Um, and, and of course, there's the movie, the bucket list movie with Morgan Freeman and who is Jack Nicholson, I think. You know, maybe watch bucket list with your dad and then actually have a conversation after watching that movie and maybe watch the intern too. Have, <laughs> we'll have movie night at the Kowalski house. <laughs> and, and then just have this conversation about, you know, you might even do the math exercise that Pat, Pat did. You know, he might find that he is not even into the fourth quarter of his life yet. He may have a whole quarter left of his life. And most, most, most football games get a lot more interesting in the fourth quarter. Most uh, plays get more interesting in the last you know, act of the play. He'll definitely understand the football metaphor. <laughs> okay, there you go. Good. That's great. I'm in on that one just a little bit. Uh, yeah, go for it. I think that uh, it's a matter of part of it, in my opinion, is the cultural narrative that we buy into. We, we allow the culture to tell us and convince us that we should be a certain way as we age. But I think another fact is that, again, you have to know what it is a person wants. I'm a health coach, and I know from experience there's no way in the world I can get a client to commit to a health program unless we first start with what is it that you want to accomplish? What is out there on the horizon that you would really like to do? And then once they get that, then they'll do the things that are necessary. So, and then I I think that the the power of baby steps, I've thought a lot about that recently, that baby steps are powerful things. And we don't, tackle the project sometime because it's so overwhelming and we're afraid to fail like, like Chip said but if we just can practice baby steps just try one little tiny step because that's how we learn to walk 
and we were experts at failure when we were babies. So you know, that's just my take on it for what it's worth. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Amir had a question. Um, and I, and I kind of know what you're, you're, you're probably thinking about. Amir is a teacher and also runs a nonprofit full time. So he has two full time jobs. Um, what wisdom can you share with when it comes to knowing the difference between powering through a challenge versus knowing when to change course to solve the challenge? Oh, wow. That's a great question. And one of the hard ones. So a friend of mine that I went to business school with is named Seth Godin. He wrote, he's a famous marketing um, guru, and he wrote a book called The Dip long ago. Which he, he hadn't done much in the world yet. So yeah. <laughs> no, he's he and I wrote a book during business school too. He, so he's a he's a, he's a he's a buddy of mine. I have a I have a, um, a daily blog called Wisdom Well, and he and I did a, a, a week long set of um, posts together. Long story short, he has this book called The Dip, and it really sort of helps to understand that you're going to have these dips in your life. The question is, when do you take the dip and take it seriously enough to say, it is time for me to do something else? And so the, the, my short answer on this without knowing the specifics is the following. One of the qualities we build as we get older is uh, pattern recognition. Pattern recognition means whether it's whether it's when it relates to humans and you can actually judge a person and I hate to use the word judge, but you can evaluate a person pretty quickly based upon what you see. Uh, sometimes you have to be careful about doing that for sure. Um, but pattern recognition around your own emotions, pattern recognition about a scenario you see at work that you've seen this picture before, you know how it's going to end even before it ends. Well, pattern recognition, when it comes to a series of things that are happening, can get you to a place where you have the intuitive wisdom, because pattern recognition and wisdom and intuition are, have, are all in the same family, such that you can know when it's time to actually press your, your foot on the, the pedal to the metal and say, no, we're going full speed ahead, still ahead, or when it's time to swerve and to say, you know what, this is, uh, we need to stop and we have to try something different. And I, so I, I think that the, the most important thing I can say there, and it's not something I can teach you, but it is something that we try to, at MEA to help you understand inside yourself, is how do you get to a place where you can see your patterns, you can see your, who you are in the through line of your life in such a way that you come away from the program a week-long program feeling like, oh, I have more confidence in my intuition or I know how to cultivate and harvest my wisdom a little bit better. And truly, if you can do that, then no matter what life throws at you, you'll have a better sense of whether you should say, go for it, we're, we're going to keep going, you know, damn the torpedoes, uh, or no, I think it's time for us to, to swerve and do something different. And, and so at, at the end of the day, the good news about this is that I, I do think it's a quality that you get better at with age. I, I think that's really helpful. Um, I was one of those that kind of hit a wall like that too. Amir, yeah, give Chip a call, let him know. Um, <laughs> we have just a few more minutes left. I didn't know if we had any more questions, if you wanted to type that in. I wanted to remind everybody, I do have my background turned off now. So this is Chip's book, Wisdom at Work. Um, and if you'd like to get a copy of that, it's on Amazon. Um, I just got mine in this week, so I've just now started working on it. Um, you, it's funny that you would mention the purple cow. I buy that by the dozens. Now I'm going to have to buy your book by the dozens. Um, <laughs> I hand it out to the nonprofits that we talk about how to differentiate yourself. And that's a great little read. Um, but, you know, as we're wrapping up, um, no doubt there are things about COVID that we've all kind of learned to that are in this uh, place. Can you tell me anything that, that has changed or that you feel like has given you some perspective because of the pandemic and kind of where we are right now? Sure. Um, well, the pandemic <laughs> has forced some reflection time on people. 
And a lot of people don't want that. <laughs> you know, we don't necessarily want to have reflective time. We like to be distracted. Um, but with that reflection time comes the opportunity to transform. It's almost like, you know, there's a, the, 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 the hero's journey is a three-stage journey. You're, 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 it, going to boot camp is a three-stage journey. You leave behind the past. You then get enculturated in this transitional world, and then you come out on the other side a new person. That is the story of the caterpillar cocoon butterfly. My feeling is that this is an opportunity. We're in the cocoon right now, and we are individually and maybe even culturally. In the cocoon, it can be dark and gooey. It is not fun to be in what we call the liminal state. When you're in limbo, you actually feel awkward, you feel dumb, you feel lost. And yet, if you can use the opportunity as, a, as an opportunity to learn something and maybe even reflect and get clear on what it is that you want to do with this precious life you have, um, you may come out on the other side with a trajectory in a direction you wouldn't have gone on, but is exactly why you're supposed to be here. Um, and so long story short is I think that that's what the COVID has allowed, allowed for if you want to use that. Um, a lot of people don't. A lot of people are just like, I want to be back to what it, how it used to be. Well, it may, I don't know if it's going to be like how it used to be. So if that's what you're looking for, disappointment equals expectations minus reality, your expectations may have to be uh, reconfigured a little bit. So I also think it, it's one more example that we are, as a society, very reliant on each other. You know, our emotions are contagious, just like this, this virus. So I, I think that it's a very good opportunity for us to realize that we all rely on each other. And uh, <clears throat> Becky, if I could just throw in one final plug, uh, I would really recommend that you consider Chip's book, uh, Wisdom at Work, Making a Modern Elder. That's certainly a great one. But also Emotional Equations. I did a review of that book for our executive book review. Uh, a few months back, it's a terrific book, especially in today's time when emotions are so rampant. And then uh, another book, uh, especially those of you who are in business, Peak, How I Got My Mojo Back from Maslow. Great book. What a creative work to take Maslow's hierarchy, which is kind of an academic uh, uh, piece, intellectual exercise. For the, and he and Chip just took it and and modeled a business around it, uh, around the customers, investors, and uh, and uh, employees. And it's just mm. elegant. So mm. check it out. Peak mm. and uh, the modern elder and emotional yeah. equations. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. I, I am, just want to say thanks to everybody. I'm going to have to drop off to, to join another call, but I, I just want to say thank you for very much, uh, most importantly to Pat, because I uh, really appreciate how, how much of an advocate you are for this important stage of life.